My name is Stella Selim. Um, I'm working for Hotline Africa Middle East as a director for regulatory affairs and stakeholder relations. Hotline Africa Middle East is uh, an association of uh, pesticide uh, manufacturers and distributors uh, for the region of Africa and Middle East. And we have uh, membership uh, from about 22 national associations based in the region. Um, who has many policy directions affecting agriculture, but the latest is the Green Deal, which is uh, really about improving the well-being of the people of Europe. Um, and they're looking at making Europe uh, climate neutral um, and protecting the natural habitat for their people. So a pronouncement of Europe and their ambitions by 2050, it, it, it seeks to have policy reforms to make uh, climate-friendly industries, uh, green financing, green technology, which is all good. The, issue about then the extension or extension to the rest of the world, how will it impact in the rest of the world, especially if uh, being in a global community, then we are looking at Europe to set the pace, Europe and other global players. So when it comes to how it will impact on other regions, uh, maybe that's where then you can ask for an opinion. What does it mean for us in Africa? What does it mean for us in Kenya? Uh, it has good things and then it has things that need to put our, our situation, current situation in perspective. So maybe just to look at one area, because it has three main strategies. It has the farm to fork strategy, it has the biodiversity strategy, it has a chemicals uh, strategy for sustainability. So what does that mean for us? In terms of farm to fork strategy, it aims at reducing pesticide reduction by 50%. Uh, it aims at putting 25% of EU agricultural land under organic production. It aims at reducing agri uh, fertilizers and also the, the, the farmland, like 10% of the farmland should be set aside for non-productive measures. So if you take that and put it on Africa or Kenya, what does it mean? Where, where, are, where is our starting point if, if, if you are talking about chemi chemical pesticide reduction? Uh, you know that Africa uses about 3%, 3 to 4% of the global pesticides market use, Africa is just at 4%. Uh, we know that green revolution has happened for the other countries or regions. Um, what about us? We are yet to experience that green revolution. So when we reduce use of fertilizer by 50, by 20% now, what does it mean in terms of production of food? Uh, when we reduce pesticide use, what does it mean in terms of uh, production of, for instance, export crop, crops that we export? So it, it needs to be put in context. Where is our beginning point and where are we going? If you look at the biodiversity strategy, uh, when we talk about um, protection of pollinators, do we know, do we have data on our pollinators? so that we know that uh, we're beginning from point A and we want to get to point B. When you look at zero pollution of the environment, that's now the chemical strategy. Uh, everyone aims not to have pollution and, and there are many sources of pollution. So when you say zero uh, in Kenya and Africa, where is the beginning point? So I think uh, in my opinion, it needs to be put in context of our current situations, um, current production challenges. We are continuing to uh, does not produce enough for our people to eat. So all those issues have to be put in context. So that's really.
it's documented word for word, for word like copy and paste, uh, then it will have uh, negative ramifications. Uh, as, as I've asked the question, when you talk about reduction of use of inputs, um, if you look at our current production levels of food, uh, let's take maize. Uh, maize is produced using fertilizer. If you cut production of maize, like 50% uh, inputs, what does that mean? You, it means you will not get the same uh, harvest, the same level of harvest you would be anticipating. And being a security, a food security crop, it means you will not have enough. Uh, and yet, uh, we don't have enough maize. We always import in, in the country. So what does that mean? So if you take crop by crop, a crop that uses uh, pesticides, for instance, the horticulture, the exports. If you would not use uh, the required uh, pesticides, what does that mean? Will that farmer still export the same quantities of food? No. So, so it, it, you really have to put it in a context of what food, who is consuming that food, what is the level of production now, and so that if you now cut and paste that policy, then it means you're going to affect the way production is happening now to the negative. If you take steps uh, and have a main policy, knowing where we are starting from and have policies that will encourage, um, uh, for instance, the, the, the saving or, or the building up of the habitat, because we know that, for instance, the destruction of forests in our continent and even in our country is very high. There's urbanization, all those things put in context so that we have biodiversity and, uh, of course, then the production of, of, of food crops. Uh, in terms of uh, zero pollution, again, it, dep it depends on where you are starting from. So then, of course, there will be for me, the, the biggest impact will be regulatory and policy uncertainty. Because you're cutting and pasting a policy uh, that is more beneficial to the EU than to you at the beginning. Uh, so what that means is then you're relegating your, for instance, regulatory framework and, and implementing another regulatory framework in terms of compliance. Uh, there will be high costs of compliance, as I've said. Uh, in some sectors, there will be loss, especially in, in, in the production of food and uh, continuing with the export market of uh, agricultural commodities. Um, the starting point. I think understanding our context in terms of if you're looking at food production, if you're looking at chemical sustainability, um, what are those policies on agricultural production in Kenya? How, how can they support us to still achieve a green revolution in Kenya, for instance? Uh, so we look at our policies and, and adapt slowly. For instance, if you want to ensure that food is produced sustainably, what is it we can do? Education of farmers. Uh, value chain, all the value chains in, in the different uh, food commodities. How do we enrich, how do we enhance the levels of production? How do we enhance, for instance, uh, traceability issues? Uh, because you, you find that in our market zone, food is in our market zone, you don't know where it's coming from. So you have no way of uh, checking the bottlenecks along the way and improving the, the food system. If you talk about food security, how do you improve, improve that? Um, so, so that there is participation, there is data. One of the things we, we, we may have data, but it's not in a way that can help us to make decisions. For instance, uh, when you talk about biodiversity, where are we in Kenya? When, when now Europe is saying they are going to plant two billion trees, uh, I'm sure we plant trees, but what targets do we have? So, we really need to look at where are we, set the baseline, and start from there and incrementally uh, improve the system of production. 
improve the environment uh, uh, so that we are not polluting the environment, but safeguarding the environment for the future. We have, like for the, in Kenya we have a big four agenda, and one of it is food security. Um, some of those ambitions are really great. Uh, without even copying and pasting, what is it we can do to the food security situation in our country? Already, uh, if, if we do that, already we are, we are aligning globally. And who said we should only align to EU? Let's take what is uh, critical for us and beneficial for us, adapt it the best as we can within our own strategies and, and build our own green revolution. Um, the safety of products is very highly regulated, pesticides, for instance, right from the development in the lab up to the time it is used and uh, disposed. They are governed by regulations. And in this country, we have regulations as the best control products. Regulations, okay? CAP 346, it's an act. And there are regulations also. At the moment, there's even revision of those regulations going on uh, to enable that uh, uh, features that were not included in the act before, because it's an old act, are included. And what do I mean by pesticides are very highly regulated? The, the act seeks to protect the environment, seeks to protect human life. Those are, those are the key actors, the key facts. And everyone working in the pesticide industry is also supposed to adhere to, to that, as well as the APO Code of Conduct yes, and Pesticides Management. Oh, yes, and so safety, the safety of pesticide is reviewed by regulators, in this case, the Pest Control Products Board. And they look at the safety when in the environment, they look at the safety of the human being, so they look at the toxicology of, of the product. And based on that evaluation, then they issue a license to either import or use that product. So it's not, it's not like just going to the shelf and buying pesticides and using it. Uh, and every time then that license expires, they have to renew. And sometimes now they have introduced a re-evaluation process where you have to provide additional data uh, for the product to be uh, released, to be allowed to be released in the market. The use of pesticide is also regulated. On the pesticide, there is a label that provides you guidance on how to use that product. It also has um, a a toll-free number where you, you, you can call to find out more about that pesticide in case of issues. So the production is regulated. The review, I have explained that you, you have to provide a dossier that shows the safety of the product for the environment and for the human being. And then the use is also regulated. The disposal is also regulated and now we have the uh, uh, we have the Environmental Management Act, and under it is a, a producer responsibility uh, introduced. So that is also going to introduce another level of safety when using the products. So how safe they are? Um, in terms of being regulated, there is enough uh, regulation, there is enough guidance on the use, the production, and the sale of the products. The other thing is uh, the farmers, how do they use this product? And a lot of work is going on in educating the farmers on how to use the products so that they ensure that uh, they keep the environment safe and they are also protected. I'm sure you have had the personal um, protection equipment, the PPE, that they need to use when applying uh, 
pesticides. And this information is also on the label of each product. So on that issue, how comes, regardless of those regulations, we still find that we end up with cases of fake chemicals? And what is your industry doing about it? Counterfeits and fake, okay. In every industry, you'll find fake, fake, uh, because um, human beings are not the same. Um, what are we doing about it? Uh, a lot of education of the farmers on how to identify what is fake. And this is in collaboration, of course, with the regulator, which is PCPD. It's in collaboration with uh, law enforcement, even the police. It is in collaboration with the customs because of the border control. Uh, so a lot of training, awareness creation on how to recognize fake. And also uh, in terms of the law, there is protection that if you are handling fake chemicals, there are fines. There are fines associated with it. Uh, the court system is also involved. So it's, it's really a collaborative effort to bring everyone on board on what we can do about handling the things and the illegal products. There's also, uh, Kenya is also collaborating with the other East African community countries uh, under the EAC Secretariat um, to look at what can they do to handle counterfeits and illegal chemicals. Before we wind up, what can you say about the issue of MPs now mm -hmm. championing to ban some of these pesticides that are in circulation? Is it a fast, is it a fast move without really understanding what is at stake? Or is it a well-measured strategy? I would say it's an issue of uh, perception. It's an issue of uh, knowledge. Uh, because when you delve in, in a very technical area, um, my, my feeling is that you need to leave that to the technical people. We have a regulatory authority, which is a pest control products board. It has experts who understand this area. We have the Ministry of Agriculture that oversees um, the authority. And in there, we have technical experts that understand this area. So for me, I would, I would um, urge that uh, let's listen, give a chance to our technical experts um, to provide the necessary advice that we need in handling this area than politicizing um, an issue that uh, is really scientific. When you bring uh, politics into science, then it ceases to be science. I believe that science can speak for itself. Um, and bringing all concerns on the table, there are answers in science. So I think the, the push, there may be some concerns, but let them be put to science and experts and let that be handled <coughs> in a scientific way and not in a politicized, Win because you can never win in a political contest of ideas. Let let arguments be made based on science. So, with the farmer being at the middle of all this, what can they do? Farmers. Everyone is purporting to be working for the farm, and. Uh, they are at a loss because when they hear our leader saying that uh, these chemicals should be banned, then they, are, they, are, they don't know what else to do. So reaching out, and that's why the industry is reaching out to farmers to continue with the training. Uh, the Ministry of Agriculture is also training farmers to understand what inputs to use at what level, including pesticides. and. Uh, especially the integrated pest management, uh, I would say methodology or approach, uh, when to use pesticide. Just like in the, in the medical field, you, you don't necessarily just go using medicines. There is a protocol. So even for the pesticides, there is a protocol. 
uh, when to use for what and how. And when you're using it, how do you handle it? So that what farmers can do is just reach out, but more especially our policy makers, our practitioners in, the, in, the, in agriculture, the extension, which is not there now, it was very critical. It's very critical for the farmer to have that rich and uh, continuous assistance on how to use or how to farm. It's very critical. So the farmers need our help, everybody's help, as long as you're in the agriculture sector. They need our help to support them. As much as we train, we need to support them in policy and uh, the extension service that they require. Science, really, that um, practitioners in the agricultural sector need to look to science. Let it be a science-based um, discussion. Uh, let us promote technology that supports our farmers to, to achieve our quote-unquote green revolution uh, so that there is enough food and there is enough uh, agricultural production to help them uh, have their livelihood because we our country is dependent on agriculture a very high um, percentage of GDP comes from agriculture so we need to look at that area as much as we have uh, we are in a global environment and we are bound to respond to markets uh, differently. Let us remember that our first, uh, first uh, responsibility as, as a country is to feed our people and feed them with good food and then help them to produce, to be able to make a living out of that production. Thank you.